the the uh, lesson writer here asks a question, which I think will remind you of something. What are some of your bucket list dreams or goals? Go to the Pacific Northwest. Okay. Go to Israel. Go to Israel. Anyone else? Anyone who's got a bucket list? I'd like to see Jerusalem. I'd like to see Jerusalem. Jerusalem, yeah. Go, go to Florida to visit my sister. Okay. I feel shallow now because my sister wouldn't appear on my bucket list. What? <laughs> I said I feel shallow now because my sister wouldn't appear on my bucket list. <laughs> well, my sister's been there 25 years and I've not been there to visit her no. once. Yeah. I was thinking of joining the church that it would be nice to have some lawn service to have all of our family there. Mm. Everybody would have everybody there and well, I reach a little further, everybody there to use it. So. Absolutely. Well, we did one time have them all here. Yeah. But Caleb and all of them were here. Oh, yeah, but I mean, you know, Kyle, too, and Jordan. Well, yeah. I'd like my yeah. brother. And, you know, we could yeah. have Yeah. I'm not asking too much, am I? <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, if... Uh, the, the lesson writer says we many have many of us have big aspirations for our lives, but if it's more than a dream, if it's a goal, we have to do some things to reach the goal. We have to work toward it. Um, God has a purpose for our lives, and God has things that He gives us dreams. He gives us things that we want that He wants, and if we aren't committed to him completely or committed to his ways, we won't be able to go where he wants to lead us. So tonight we're going to look at uh, the idea of communal dedication to God. <coughs> communal dedication to God. Okay, so let's look uh, at our Bibles and let's see. Uh, Kathy, how you feel about reading that loud? You okay with that? You look at chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. Nehemiah? Yeah. Don't read it yet. Um, and um, Pam, you okay with that? Reading yeah. that loud? Okay. You look at chapter 12 and um, go about, let's say, 27 through... 36. And Ricky, yes. you look at 12, 20, uh, 37 to 43. Where is that at? Nehemiah. Nehemiah. Chapter 12, 37 to 43. Okay. Okay? Yep. Um, and um, Don, how about you? Read Nehemiah chapter 10, 28 through 39, and you can go ahead. If you're willing, I'm just going to ask you that. Okay. You did it now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 10, 28. Now the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, and the temple servants, and all those who had separated themselves, from the people of the land to the law of God, their wives, their sons, and their daughters, all those who had knowledge and understanding, are joining with their kinsmen, their nobles, and are taking on themselves a curse and an oath to walk in God's law, which was given through Moses, God's servant, and to keep and observe all the commandments of God our Lord and his ordinances and his statutes and that we will not give our daughters to the peoples of the land or take their daughters for our sons. As for the peoples of the land who bring wares or any grain on the Sabbath day to sell, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or every day. And we will forgo the crops the seventh year and the exaction of every death. 
We also place ourselves under obligation to contribute yearly one third of a shekel for the service of the house of our God, for the shoe bread, for the continual grain offering, for the continual burnt offerings, the Sabbaths, the new moons, and the appointed times, for the holy things, and for the sin offering to make atonement for Israel and all the work of the house of God, of our God. Likewise, we cast lots for the supply of wood among the priests, the Levites, and the people, so that they might bring to the house of our God, according to our Father's household, at fixed times annually, to burn on the altar of the Lord our God, as it is written in the law, and that they might bring the first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of all the fruit of every tree to the house of the Lord annually. And bring to the house of our God the firstborn of our sons and of our cattle, and the firstborn of our herds and our flocks, as it is written in the law, for the priests who are ministering in the house of our God. We will also bring the first of our dough, our contributions, the fruit of every tree, the new wine and oil of the priest, and the chambers of the house of our God, and the tithe of our God ground to the Levites, for the Levites are the, they who receive the tithes in all the rural towns. The priest, the son of Aaron, shall be with the Levites when the Levites receive tithes, and the Levites shall bring up the tenth of the tithes to the house of our God, to the chamber of the storehouse. For the sons of Israel and the sons of Levi shall bring the contribution of the grain, the new wine, and the oil to the chambers. There are the utensils of the sanctuary, the priests who are ministering to the gatekeeper and the singers. Thus we will not neglect the house of our God. Okay, and now uh, Kathy? <coughs> Just one or two, is that right? Uh -huh. <laughs> now the leaders of the people settled in Jerusalem, and the rest of the people cast lots to bring one out of every tent who lived in Jerusalem, the holy city, where the remaining nine were to stay in their own towns. The people commended all the men who volunteered to live in Jerusalem. Okay, uh, Pam, <coughs> 27 to 36. And uh, at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought the Levites out of all their places to bring them to Jerusalem to keep the dedication with flagons, both with thanksgivings and with singing, with cymbals, psalteries, and the hearts. And the sons of the singers gathered themselves together, both out of the plain country or round about Jerusalem and from the villages of. Yeah, keep going. That's fine. <laughs> okay. Also from the house of Gilgal, mm -hmm. and out of the fields of Geba, and as Lake, for the singers had builded the villages round about Jerusalem. And the priests and the Levites purified themselves and purified the people and the gates and the wall. Then I brought up the princes of Judah upon the wall and appointed two great companies of them that gave thanks, whereof one went on the right, <coughs> hand, the right hand and upon the wall toward the dung gate. And after them went Hoshiah and half the princes of Judah, and Azariah, Ezra, and Meshalam, Judah, and Benjamin, and Shemaiah, and Jeremiah, and certain of the priests' sons with trumpets, namely Zechariah, the son of Jonathan, the son of Shemaiah, the son of Mekaniah, the son of Meshia, the son of Zechar, the son of Asaph, and his brethren, Shemaiah, and <coughs> Israel, Malali, Malali, Dalia, Nai, Samuel, and Judah, and Nani, with the musical instruments of David, the man of God, and Ezra the scribe before them. Okay, yeah. you can pick it up from there. Would you tell me to read? Start with 37 of chapter 12, and you're going to uh, 43. 43. At the fountain gate, they continued directly up the steps <coughs> of the city of David, and on ascent to the wall, passed above the site of David's palace to the water gate on the east. The second choir proceeded in the opposite direction. I followed them on top of the wall together and half the people past the tower of ovens to the broad wall over the gate of Ephraim and Isaiah 
gate and fish gate, the tower of Ananiah, and the tower of a hundred, as far as the sheep gate, at the gate of the guard that stopped. The two choirs that gave thanks then took their places in the house of God. So did I, together with half of the officials, as well as the priests of Elikiah, Masaniah, Menahina, however. Yeah, they're not here. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Micaiah, Eleanoah, Zechariah, Ananiah, and their trumpets, and also Masaiah, Shemaiah, Elazar, Uzai, Jehol, Jehanan, Melchiah, Elam, and Ezar. The choir sang under the direction of Jezariah, and on the day they offered great sacrifices rejoicing because God had given them great joy. The women and the children also rejoiced. The sound of rejoicing in Jerusalem could be heard far away. All right. Thank you. Whenever you get to all those names and you know nobody around you is named that, <laughs> if you read it confidently, even if you read it wrong, then the people that would have read it right are thinking, wait, maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. You just read confidently. I was you know, they're not here. I was going to yell down and tell Donnie to read that. Because <laughs> he usually knows them. All right. That's because he reads confidently. Yeah. He doesn't know. He just reads confidently. <laughs> All right. Anyway, uh, while you watch the video tonight, pay attention to how he will answer these three questions. Why do we, as a community, need to dedicate ourselves to God? What does it mean to have a biblical worldview? And what should our relationship to the world be like? I started finding out that uh, the uh, TV doesn't like to wait on me. Hmm. sons, he wants to be uh, a actor. He really, really, really wants to be an actor. But right now, he is, he's 13, he is begging, his name is Nehemiah, by the way. Uh, he is begging me to start a YouTube channel. And, um, and, and I'm, I, I, I feel him. I love that about him. He's a, he's a very sweet kid, very creative. Um, but one of the things I've been on him about is, I said, man, I hear what you, want, you say you want to do, but I don't see the things in your life right now pertaining to it where you're really showing that you're committed to it. I said, you're not really giving me any clarity that you're committed to it. I said, I'll, listen, I said, listen, if you show me you're committed, I'll meet you in that commitment. 
by, by, by getting you pieces of things that you need for your journey as a creator. And I don't know what happened in him overnight. Um, me as his father, letting him know that if you show commitment towards me, I'll meet you in that commitment and I'll move you forward, uh, has put a fire under him to not have a level of commitment that I haven't seen in him. Now he's making videos, now he's asking me for microphones and he's working on different things and creating video content and practicing his acting. Um, he was in a play, so I, I, I'm, I'm blown away at what he, what he did. I, I think chapter 10 is one of those chapters. Um, this is what Israel has lacked, faithfulness. Like God promised them, literally, if you do things my way, I'll meet you in you doing things my way. If you don't do things my way, I won't meet you in it. It's interesting that there's a New Testament principle that James kind of utilizes that's similar to this. If you draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. Remember, the big picture of this book is for the people of God to be God's light in the world. That, that, that's the deal. However, in doing that, um, God promises to, to meet them as they are functioning as a light. And so now, at the end of chapter 9, they got a vow of faithfulness. We'll get to that at some point in this. But what you begin to see is, in verse 1, it says, Those whose seals were on the document, the governor, Nehemiah, Zedekiah, and then it goes down, all these other Hiah, Sias, Mayas, all of them, are basically making a formal commitment to God. That is an important thing. And what, what's, what, what's beautiful about this is many times we see formal commitment as individual, but what we look at in this in this passage is we see uh, this commitment that they're making to God is communal. Why? Because we're so individualistic in Western culture that really it's not just about individual commitment. It has to be communal. It has to be all of us together uh, linking up together. Um, I, I, I don't know if any of you ever won. One of my favorite shows in the 80s was Voltron. I loved, loved, loved Voltron. Voltron was um, these, these, these scattered lion robots that would fight enemies, alien enemies, and whenever they would be overpowered by that enemy, they would link up together and form Voltron. These, these, they're no longer individual lions. They were individual lions when they were by themselves, but when they came together, they weren't called lions, they were called Voltron. And, you know, that's how the church has to be. The church has to have a Voltron, if you will, disposition of us being seen as a community. And when, the, when, when commitment starts with the leaders, the community will follow. I can't tell you, as I post a lot of stuff on social media about things like church hurt, and um, different challenges that are in the church that we need to overcome. Many, guess what people talk about? One of the main things people talk about is their frustration with leaders not managing issues in the body well to help people to be unified so that we can be alike. And so what, what I like about their prayer in, the, in chapter 9 that we see applied here is the first people to confess and repent of their sin was the leaders, but the first ones to commit themselves to covenant renewal were the leaders. It says in verse 14, the heads of household. It said in verse 9, the Levites. In verse 8, it said the priests. Um, and then it says in verse 28, the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers. And so now it's going through all of these things. But guess what it said? It said, everyone who was able to understand separated themselves from the surrounding people to obey the law of the Lord. And now, in other words, in separating themselves from the peoples wasn't them separating themselves from people that were a part of the believing community who would want to attach themselves to Israel. No, they're talking about people that aren't committed to the Lord. And so one of the things that the, the commitment demands is that we don't let culture influence us in how we follow the Lord, and we don't bring those cultural influences in when we're being consecrated and separated unto the Lord into our biblical worldview. What is a biblical worldview? It's a grid for how you look at um, think about uh, 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 and, and view life and everything in our world based on how the Bible grids it out. And so when we look at this commitment, it says, Lady says, join with the noble brothers and commit themselves with a sworn oath to follow the law of God given through God's servant Moses and to obey carefully all the commands, ordinances, and statutes of the Lord our God. God. That's, that's really what we need in this time period. 
we have to begin to say, how do we as the believers and the people of God get on the same page? The way we get on the same page and, and the way they got on the same page is what they did in chapter 8 is they got in the word of God uh, to really, really help them. So because they didn't, they hadn't been in the word and developing a biblical worldview for a long time to the point where they were absolutely shocked. This stuff was in the Bible. I remember the other day I was spending some time in Exodus. So I saw something in there I hadn't, I, I read a thousand times but hadn't seen it there. It's something about when God arrests all of us together so that we can see very clearly what it is that we need to do in committing ourselves to do that. The way this section ends and, and the way it goes through the entire chapter is it gives key things that they do when they make vows. Of course, that's based on Ecclesiastes, the five, where no one is to make a vow and not keep that particular vow. But then as you go through the framework of the chapter, it's basically covenantal commitment again, uh, particularly everything from the Sabbath to all of the different Sabbaths and new moons and festivals, first fruits and their tithing and all of these different things, right? But then it says, we will not neglect the house of our God. The house of God or the temple, uh, for us, the house of God really just represents back then God's dwelling presence in the earth. Now the people of God together, we are now tabernacles. Jesus ultimately is the one who tabernacled among us. That's what it says in John chapter 1, verse 14. And then, but then in 1 Timothy, uh, 1 Corinthians rather, chapter 3, it says we are uh, a, a temple of the Holy Spirit. It talks about that. It talks about that reality of us being a temple in 1 Peter chapter 2. But what, one of the things that we, we want to nuance here, I don't want us, and this is, this is a good takeaway for us, I don't want us to separate sacred and secular life. <laughs> one of the things we tend to do is we believe separation uh, means isolation. That is absolutely, extremely opposite of what God wants us to do. Because guess what? In John chapter 17, guess what he says? He, he says, I want you to keep them in, don't take them out of the world, but keep them while they're in the world. Guess what that means? He wants us to be insulated, but not isolated. Let me say that again. He wants us to be insulated, insulated from the effects of the world, but not isolated from engaging the world. So in God calling us to be a light, us being a light isn't us just getting together on Sunday, even though I value us getting together on Sunday. It's not just our small group. It's not just our Sunday school. It's not just our Bible study. We utilize those as fueling stations, connection stations, and places to really have our light lit up, if you will. So that when we go into the work of the Bible says, who takes a light and put it under a pen measure, right? You put it on a table for it to shine the whole house. And guess what? God wants the world to be shown, shined by the people of God. However, it starts with us as God's people having a unified commitment to God's end. When we get on the same page with God, repent, work through that stuff, get on the same page. Now we gather and we scatter into the world. We scatter into culture. So there's no sacred or secular in God's mind. It's just us being separate in how we reflect him as we go as ambassadors into the world. That's so important. And I pray that God would grace us to, to this is something we have to grow in progressively. But I believe that because of what Christ has done on the cross and, and, and him getting us from the grave and empowering us by the spirit and informing us by his word, that I, 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 it's not going to be a cakewalk, but it's definitely going to be a possible walk. And so... Let, let's let's let, let's not end our commitment to figuring out how it looks to be a healthy people of God in the world that represents God by being a light in it. Okay, why do we need, as a community, to dedicate ourselves to God? We're greater together than we are separate. Okay. Just want to be a team, not just a bunch of individuals. Okay. And if we're dedicated to him, then we show more of him in our lives. 
Okay. Um, I was uh, going through the membership stuff with Cheyenne this morning, and uh, I was telling her that when we when we commit our heart to Christ and we receive salvation, that's sort of a him and me thing, but immediately then we become part of his people. And when we think about you know, church membership, for example, that's like a formal commitment, not to God, to each other. Mm -hmm. That's a formal commitment we make to one another to say, uh, you know, this is where I am serving God. I, I uh, pointed out to her, when you look at the scriptures, in the, in the New Testament, for example, um, you know you do find exam you do find instances of Jesus wanting to be alone. But what was he doing when he was alone? He was praying. So like, he, there's not like you know what I just gotta have some me time. You guys go do something else for a while. He never does that. He goes off to pray. So that he can come back and they can be together. Uh, I also was thinking when we were watching this that uh, one of the most horrifying things in reading the the, uh, the gospels is when you encounter the leper, and the leper has these two terrible things happen to them. One of them is worse than the other. And I think that most of us would immediately say, yeah, the worst thing would be like having leprosy. And I don't think that's the worst thing. The worst thing is you get leprosy, you go somewhere else. Mm. And if you're going to get anywhere near us, you start yelling loud enough so we can go the other direction. That's a punishment. That's a terrible thing. And it's not something that any of them would have wanted. Then we get to modern day America. We're, we're like seeking after the same sort of thing and probably none of you are on social media as much as I am. I, I see these people that want to trumpet how proud they are of being, well, I'm an introvert. Well, I'm an introvert. I need this. I need that. I need Stop. You can be whatever you want to, but if you're going to be part of the Lord, you got to be part of his community, and it is community. And sometimes that means you're with other people. And whether you whether that's like what floats your boat or not. So I, uh, for the person that might say, well, Pastor, but that doesn't sound like you're being very understanding of like how they're wired. Yeah, you know what? Some people are wired to want to talk all the time. But we don't expect them to exercise that freedom in church on a regular basis. Just like, you got something to say, we'll stop everything. Pastor, quit preaching a minute, they got something to say. We don't do that. I mean, it's their it's their nature to be very gregarious and open and want to talk. They got, But we expect that for the good of the body, we are all sort of coming together. You know, all the levels are evening out. I don't suppose, I, I mean, like, I, I would have normally not been wired so as to want to hang out with a bunch of people, but because I'm part of the body, I'm going to rise to that occasion. And I might be one that wants to just be in charge of everything, but because I'm part of the body, I tamp down that part so we can all be working together. Pastor, when you were talking about uh, <coughs> Jesus being alone and wanting that me time, is it being alone? communing with the Father, isn't that the ultimate experience of meantime? I mean, I, I don't... Words, you know, I thought, well, I, I've got to get away from that. I want, want me time. Yeah, I can understand what you're saying. But if I'm alone with the Father, and I'm communing with Him, to me, that's the best me time that, you, that a person can have. Yeah. yeah. It's just not what people normally do. Right. <laughs> okay. Uh, what does it mean to have a biblical worldview? Believe the Bible. Believe the Bible, yes. He used a word that I want to see if anybody remembers. Oh, 
The world view has the word view in it, so we see things through a a grid. We see things through a grid of scriptural principles. A biblical worldview comes about because we spend time in the scriptures and we become a student of the scriptures. Not in a way somebody that goes to seminary or something like that is. Just that we are <coughs> In effect, through the reading of this word, we are sitting at Jesus' feet in a way, sort of like his disciples did when they were all together. And so as we do that, then when things come up, we should start seeing our way of perception change so that, you know, it's uh, it's not hard to find people's worldview if you're around them something happens that was not pleasant and they might say i'll tell you what that i'll tell you if that ever happens to me again i'm going to take care of it okay that expresses a world view you do wrong by me i'm gonna get you back i i had a roommate at all of that um one year i was in a, an apartment with five other guys and one of the guys was named doug but i called him 70 times seven doug <laughs> because Doug had the, the idea that if you did something to him, he was going to just go overboard in retribution. He wasn't hateful. I, he wasn't mean, but like, I, it just, to me, it's like, okay. When I called him, and I called him that to his face, 70 times 7, Doug. I, that, well, I wasn't really... That wasn't a compliment from me. It was like, oh, that's cool. You, you tied me to the Bible. Yeah, not to the good parts. <laughs> um, it, that makes them, you know, like, I'm going to back off of that. But see, if we have a biblical worldview, when something happens, then I start thinking, what would Jesus want me to do in this position? That's a biblical worldview that we start seeing things through the lens of the scriptures. Um, and one more, what would, what should our relationship to the world be like? Insulated, not isolated. Okay. Insulated from the effects of the world, but not isolated from the world. If we are only ever around each other, our limit, our ability to influence someone for eternity is probably limited. Is that the same of be in it but not of it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is this is a this is maybe a challenging one for us sometimes because we if we're around church long enough, we get to where church is our thing. And that's awesome. Church is my thing. But it can be our thing so much that, like, not church becomes something we're trying to avoid. And that's a problem. Because somebody has to be there for the person that's never going to come here. And they ain't coming. Some people are never going to come to church just out of the blue. I mean, more people come to this church seemingly out of the blue than any church I've ever been a part of. I don't know if it's because it's in the middle of a neighborhood. That probably helps a lot. But I mean, like, it's amazing. But a lot of those people, they come out of the blue and they go. They come and go. Whereas... We have other people that come to church and they're regular because they were connected to somebody that brought them in. And, and that's a better thing. And it's a more long-lasting thing. Sustainability is big in our world. That's a, that's a sustainable thing. So it's important when somebody does come in out of the blue that we try to connect with them. Absolutely. We have, yes. Yeah. I mean, like, our church 
the church that Rachel and I got married in, West Side in Indianapolis, that was probably six, <laughs> seven hundred on the uh, average Sunday. Okay, when you don't know somebody at that church, I understand. If you don't know somebody at this church, I say this lovingly, that's your fault, and it should be something you solve. This is not a big church. Not hard to get around everybody. And especially if you're focused on, I want to, you take a quick scan every time we're together and see who you don't know or don't know well. Make that the priority. But I don't mean like, that's, that's the way that can be fixed. When we went home at eight this morning at the church, when you come up to the door, there's somebody opening the door for you, greeting you to go in. When you get in there, there's at least four or five people there with uh, the bulletins ready to hand them out to you to greet you and make you feel welcome. When Kathy and I went and sat down, at least two or three or four lay people or just p congregational people just came up and welcomed us to the church. And of course, we told them our connection. We were there to see our uh, son-in-law preach. And... Um, and that's then I saw a pastor, my son in law, preached in, uh, out of this one book that he was quoting. And this is kind of where this theme's going. It said, If the church is not sending, it's ending. And that was out of a book that he quoted. So if the church is not sending, it's ending. And that's kind of what we're talking about here. If we're not going to go outside, we're not going to grow. We're not going to, we're going to come to an end. Yeah. Um, Okay, so there's okay. there's no way to get through all of this at one time, which is fine. Yeah. Which is fine. So I'm just going to hit a couple things here. Uh, so when we think about this uh, commitment to God, communal or individual, you know, we, I talked about Jesus as an example really was not individual. He was with people. Um, when a lot of times people get mm, a little, they get their back up a little bit like, well, I mean, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Or, you don't, I can serve God just fine like this at my level. You know, they have, they're clearly defining their level of commitment to the community of church while at the same time proclaiming their commitment to God. But if that if that's true, if our commitment to the community is not important, well then I'm, I, I'm put in the mind of uh, in uh, the book of Joshua, they come into the promised land and they they go first battle, Jericho, Yay, they win. It's awesome. Then they get to Aiken. Should have been a cakewalk. They get beat. And a bunch of people die. Why? Because one guy said, well, I can, I can do things the way I want to do it. Who are you to tell me what to do? Now, it doesn't say those words, but that's the equivalent. Well, I can do. I don't have to do that. I can do it this way. And he he came up with his own way of you know what would be okay. And the whole community suffered for it. And when Paul talks about the community of Christ is the body of Christ, that's such a great image because uh, you know we think of that at the body of Christ, and we think you know well. This person's like the hand, and this person's the eye. Yeah, forget all that. <coughs> None of us may be as important as a hand or an eye, but we're all part of the body. But th how about this? You pick a small part of your body, typically in in insignificant. <laughs> and when that one little part of your body starts being hurt, the rest of your body finds a way to stop everything to alleviate as if you can that one hurt. When I look at my fingers and my toes, there are two out of the 20 that seem insignificant. They're my little toe. My little toe's not very big. That's why I call it my little toe. <laughs> it serves no purpose except 
to find furniture that's not where it should be. And all of a sudden, that little insignificant digit becomes really important. And our my body takes care of my body. My body takes care and is concerned with my body. My toe owes it to the rest of my body not to kick itself into other furniture because all of us get bothered when that happens. And the body of Christ is like that. We, we owe it to one another. This uh, scene that we were, that he was talking about, they've come back, and I think it's important to remember, not that you don't, but reminders are always good. The people here in Israel are coming back to Israel after being in exile for 70 years. <clears throat> for 70 years. Now, put that into perspective, before the people of Israel ever got into the promised land, you recall they were on their way to the promised land, and they got there, and they're like, hey, let's send some people in to check it out. They check it out, they come back, Ten of them said, or two of them said, let's go do it. Ten of them said, nah, I don't think we should. And the whole community voted down the two in favor of the ten, what they have to do? Wander around. Yeah. How long do they have to wander around? 40 years. Why? So that all the adults die. <laughs> so Israel's been in there for 70 years. There are very few people that came back that were there ever. It's, it's like a new entrance into the promised land. When they got there, everything had to be sort of redone. And so that's why they're going through this uh, they build the wall because without the wall, there's no security. They build the temple in Ezra, the book of Ezra. They build the temple because they want to worship God. They re they reread the law. They sat there all day while the reading of the law because this is like what, this is what we're supposed to be about. And they they start reinstituting all this stuff. Where it says in there uh, it was one of the passages that we read tonight talked about not marrying. Outside, I think it's important for us to remember, because this is a knock on scripture sometimes, people think it's, you know, it's like racist or whatever. It's got nothing to do with racism, why they were talking about not marrying other people. And even went so far as to say people that had disregarded God's word on that, separated. It was because those people, that act of marrying other people, not Israelites, is one of the main things that got them into the mess they were in to start with. It was because that was taking them away from the worship of God. They were marrying outside the faith, and those people were worshiping idols. And that's what got them there in the first place. So that's why they're taking that stuff seriously now. Also, the reason Nehemiah is hard to read is because of that list of names the names were important to them because they're they're reminding themselves of their ties going all the way back to when they were there before. And, and so that, that's why that's in there like that. Um, all right, what would, let's see. He talked about having a biblical worldview. When you have a decision to make or a circumstance, that you don't know how to navigate, where do you go for answers? God. How? Through the Bible. Bible. Okay, through reading scripture. Or Christian friends. That can help okay, you. other people in the, in the faith community, Christian friends. Prayer. Prayer, okay. Yeah. So I told you, I, I've mentioned before, the one kid I knew at Olivet that was telling me how spiritual he was one day when he said, every day before I go to the closet, I pray, God, which shirt should I wear today? And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm not praying that. Yeah. <laughs> I just said, you know, I mean, like, I, how about if I don't have any shirts that God would always say no to? And then maybe he'll let me worry about the rest. Uh, but when I have a decision... Those things, those things are good ways of, of doing it. But I would put to you that I think all three of those are valid and all three should work together for reasons we've already said. 
So for example, if, if I'm only praying, I, uh, how many of you have ever thought you, you pray about something and you thought you knew which way God wanted you to go, and then later on it turned out maybe that wasn't the way God yeah. wanted me to go. Or you pray and you think, I'm not sure what he's telling me. Seems like I don't really hear. Okay, that might be real. All right, so if you only pray, well, you're still kind of stuck. If you only read the scripture, it's very possible for you to come up with a faulty plan of action based on the way you're reading. Like, for example, okay, I need to really know what's going on, so I get my magic eight ball. <laughs> and I do the thing, and I go, okay, consider now the Lord's chosen you to build a house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. Do it, okay, whatever I thought I was doing. I guess that's, <laughs> God says go. Okay, that's, don't do that. But if I do all three, I pray, I get a sense of what God's thinking, I go to the scripture, not like I just said, kind of a systematic way, I go to the scripture, and I go to Christian brothers and sisters, then there's like all sorts of checks and balances that God's already given me. I, 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 don't, I, I can come up with things, with ideas that are sort of harebrained at times. And if no one is ever going to tell me it's a harebrained idea, then I do things that are dumb. <laughs> I mean, that's just the way it is. We need each other, and, and God's given us each other. And so, you know, it would be okay. Isn't that why we're called the family of God? Right. It would be okay to go and, and just, let me run something by you real quick. I mean, in the family of God, we are all brothers and sisters. But in our earthly families, I don't know how it is or was with you, but I mean... If you're still able to, that's awesome. If you're not able to anymore, I'll bet you remember times and wish there were still those times where you can call up dad and ask him, what do you think about this? Mm -hmm. I can still call my dad. I don't ask him those questions so much anymore because he's kind of at a point where he's asking me things. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's amazing when you, you have to get past 21 before you realize how smart dad really was. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, but we have each other for that. Um, um, here's a question they put here. It's not for one, not one to answer out loud, just for us to sort of ponder. What would it take for us to go to God for answers before anyone else? Um, by the way, I mentioned not just like flipping through the Bible and pointing. Um, so if we wonder like, well, what, how would I? Well, the idea that I'm going to take my Bible and apply it specifically to the problem of the day, I'm not so sure that's really how that works in my life. There are times it does. There are times when, you know, I, I had an occasion this afternoon when I was reading uh, a book. Uh, it wasn't the Bible, but it was a Christian book. And all at once, the Lord was like, hmm, convicted me of something I had done this week. Something I said that I should not have said. And I was like, oh, no. Mm -hmm. And then I was thinking, how am I going to make this right? Boy, I don't know if I can do it on Monday. He's a school person. I don't know if I can do it on Monday because, well, I'm here at church all day Monday, and I'm kind of picky about that day. Mm -hmm. And then Tuesday. And then, and then, so I kept reading. And then... <clears throat> Like, okay. So I just put my book down and I went outside and got my phone out and I called the person and I said, Hey, I need to apologize to you. And it was it it, it was fine. Now I didn't go to scripture to get the direction at that moment, but being in the scripture every day for a long time. And I'm not suggesting like I missed a day, and so now it's not valid. Being in the scripture pretty much every day, regularly, lets me know 
that it, that's what gives me that biblical worldview so that when one of those occasions come up, I'll have to look for it. I'm like, yeah, pretty much if you know, let's say if there's somebody, if you know, if you're going to the altar and you realize there somebody's got something against you, you go and make it right. I don't even have to have the chapter and verse. I don't have to quote it right or anything. I know that's what that mm -hmm. says. You written so God points something out, you go fix it. That's a biblical worldview. That's that's what we do. Um, and I think that just staying in the word, even on those days when you read it and you're like, maybe you are, maybe you're reading through, like the plan that we've been doing, and <clears throat> you're in that time when it's like Nehemiah or First Chronicles, and you're like, yeah, there's those days. Guess what? You're not getting your direction from that that day. But God will reward you for staying in his word, and you get past that, and you move on to other things that do help you better. Pastor, i got a question. My husband's been dead for two years, and I still see him at mm -hmm. night. Mm -hmm. Can you I ask God why every other night? I see him. Hmm. When you're asleep or when you're getting ready I'm for bed? I'm not dreaming or anything. Yeah. I'd say it's just memories. I mean, you you spent a lot of years seeing him, and those memories are real. And yeah. You're by yourself, so I, I think that's just yeah. your... What well, kind of bothers me yeah. at times. I jump up and turn the light on just mm. to see if he is there. Mm -hmm. Well, let me assure you of a couple of things. First of all, he, he's not going to be. Yeah. So you don't have, I mean, like you can know that and then you can maybe just make it a matter of prayer. Maybe at supper time for a while. Yeah. When you're praying for your food, ask the Lord to help you tonight. What makes that happen? I, I don't think it's God making it happen. I think it's just our... Your brain. Your, mind, brain. your mind. Yeah. 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 Your memory. It's yeah. it's a similar but different sort of a thing to where you're having that issue. Your mind is working in that way. Rachel goes to bed at night and she can't quit thinking about all the things that have happened that day. Yeah, that's I don't have either of those problems. Yeah. I have other problems, but well, I don't I, have those problems. Yeah. If it's, I can't worry about the kids, I'm worrying about somebody else. <laughs> Maybe turn those into prayers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's what I've been trying to do. Yeah. yeah. Well, today, today you buried that. Yeah. You buried that, and so you, now you know where you're gonna go. Yeah. And, and that's everything's everything's good from now on. Yeah. Martin Luther, the great reformer, 500 years ago, would when he got concerned or bothered by things, he he sometimes would say. I am a baptized man. And he took great comfort from that. Amen. Here you go. I see when you got baptized. You today. are a baptized woman. Yes. And, and that Amen. means something. Yeah. Let it mean something to you yeah. those yeah. moments too. Yeah. Yeah. Can I share something about the body? Yeah. On my way to my test the other day, I don't know why, I was nervous. Maybe anticipation, you know, of wanting it to help. But I was nervous. And I started getting these texts from the ladies, you know, that Rachel and the ladies, that everybody was praying for me. And I told Glenn, I just felt so empowered. Mm -hmm. I, I walked in, you know, it just completely, I felt totally filled with the Holy Spirit. I, I just felt like my church family was just right there around <laughs> me, going, in, going in there. And I think that we forget and we don't realize something. What that can do and what it is meant to do. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. And thank you all for doing that. Well, and so using that as as a kind of a springboard, and we'll close with this. You mentioned James four eight, which is draw near to me, and I'll draw near to you. A lot of people wonder why they just feel like God is so distant. Well, <laughs> we draw near to Him, and He'll draw near to us. We go to him, he'll come to us. I think that principle works with the body itself, too. We often feel lonely. I, I'm guilty. And before I say this, 
I'm not asking for a thing. Mm -hmm. I'm guilty sometimes of having these conversations with Rachel about different friends, not at church, different friends like, well, I'm, all, I'm always the one that reaches out to them. Won't they ever reach out to me? Okay, I don't have a good answer for that question. But I don't have to be lonely because I can reach out to my brothers and sisters in Christ. Or I, or I could just sit back at home looking at my phone wondering, what for me? Why won't anybody reach out to me? Well, I could do that. But I mean, I, I just sort of think we do that, to, we, we, we help out each other, and then when it is our turn, then we get those texts, and like it's like, hey, people really do mm -hmm. care. That's right. Amen. Well, I appreciate your time tonight. We're going to have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for uh, the uh, discussion and your word tonight and the lesson. It's been a valuable thing, Lord. I just pray that you'd be with us and uh, help us to understand what a what a fantastic thing that our salvation is, but also, Lord, what a great thing the body of Christ is, that you've given us one another, that we don't have to be alone, and that you don't want us to be alone. You want us to be in community, and uh, we can do things together that we could never do on our own. And I pray that you would help us to remember that. And I pray that you would help Marianne this week to remember, yes. to be encouraged, to know that she was buried with Christ this morning and raised yeah, to new yeah, life yeah, yeah. in baptism. Help her to remember that and to cling to that. I pray that you'd help her with this issue she's mentioned, that uh, that would soon become a thing of the past, Lord. We don't know why sometimes our minds work the way they do, but our, that's just a, a part of life sometimes for us, Lord, and we have to learn to give that to you as well. I pray that you'd help that to be the case. Go with us as we go out into the world and help us to shine for you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for coming.